everyone, I am Rajushree. A very warm welcome to you all in today's episode and a huge thanks for being with me in my experimental musical journey. Today, as the title suggests, we know by now that we are going to celebrate the work of one of the most controversial composers to me, who is the hero of all heroes in the world of composition, a genius. Critics say the ill-fated, brilliant composer. He is none other than Robert Schumann. We should be traveling back to the early 19th century, but before that, I would request all of you to stay with me in 2023, just for a few minutes. Because I like to share a few lines from an article written by Richard Morrison, the chief critic, music critic, and columnist of the Times. Uh, and he has a regular column in BBC Music Magazine. So we are going to celebrate a man who was born in Germany 212 years ago, 212 years and four days ago, because 8 June was Robert Schumann's birthday. And why I am sharing an article which is written in 2023, uh, you all will understand very soon. Richard Morrison said, quote, If fate with enough music, it's true, computers can now ape the rules of composition and historical styles. But great composers break rules, revolutionize style. That's their job. They use their skills at manipulating oral phenomena somehow to convey emotions from their brains to ours. Machines, by definition, don't do emotion. Machine, what, what they don't have, quote, is the uniquely human capacity to reflect life and death, love and loss, entirely in sound waves. And Robert Schumann, maybe less than 200 years ago, when he was uh, just becoming quite well known as a composer, and he actually expressed his vision as a composer, uh, he said, music's only function was to express what a composer feels. Composition for him was not a matter of building a structure in musical notes, but of finding an outlet for personality. The emotional content is the most important element in Schumann's music, and he's of strong, expressive So, the genius was a true visionary. 212 years ago, we were standing in the era of pre-Prozac, pre-Freud, and pre-psychiatry. Uh, it happened many a times in history that the imaginative leaps taken by the genius are misunderstood, not even understood at that time, at their time. And today's musicians, composers, music critics are going through a lot of researches and publishing articles regarding Schumann's compositions, which are actually quite contemporary in this time and era. Untamed hair, bohemian clothes, replaced the dressy wigs and formal costumes of classical period of Western classical music. Beethoven broke the mold, ripped up the rule books, 
one of my another very uh, favorite pianist, James Rhodes, I keep on quoting him. He said, this was the first time in the history of music. Music was about human emotions. Beethoven made music about interiority. Yes. No more about the glory of God. No more for the peop for the aristocrats to be entertained in their drawing room or in their salons. But after Beethoven, there was a sad, sad stagnation, which we have to acknowledge. And I'm reading a few lines again from a book called The Literature of the Piano. And it's beautifully said there, dry classicism, classicism was the order of the day. The composers then active met all the superficial requirements of sonata, rondo and concerto without possessing the genius to give a higher meaning to the forms. Schumann summed up the situation. Rossini reigned supreme in opera. Little was hard on the piano. The influence of Mendelssohn and Chopin had not yet made itself felt. The time was ripe for revolt. Indeed. And who came, came in that picture? It was none other than Robert Schumann. 1810, he was born in Germany, in the kingdom of Saxony. Uh, his father was a writer, poet, translator, bookseller. Mother was a lyrical singer. So he, he got an environment of literature, art around him. <coughs> from, sorry, from very childhood, he was exposed to the poetry and literature written by the great uh, German writers and poets, Jean Paul Hoffman, P.T.A. Hoffman, and many others. So in today's episode, before I go ahead, I need to tell all of you that I'm going to approach it in a very, very different way. I'm going to talk about in this part of the episode, of the whole uh, episode which I have made for Robert Schumann, Schumann, about the ingredients of the compost which made the fertile soil of his mind and brain. Because he is such a controversial character and so much have been said about his mental health, I thought it is very important for us to know about his brain and mind. What actually helped him to compose these masterpieces? What what, how he was groomed, that is very important. Coming back to his literary environment, in his school he used to organize a book club and in that book club he used to refer to Jean Paul's lot of writings. In Jean Paul's writing, Rather, rather, we can say that Jean Paul was the one who coined the word doppelganger. Doppelganger is actually a character which is a mysterious character and, and a double of someone who is alive. So, we have seen that in future, Robert Schumann actually played doppelganger game with his beloved wife, Clara Schumann, who is one of the virtues of pianist 
in the Romantic era. And doppelganger is very important. The word doppelganger is very important in his life because just after his 21st birthday, we have uh, seen that in his diary, he mentioned about two characters, Eusebius and Florestan. They were his alter egos. Florestan was hot-headed, very expressive, extrovert, and Eusebius was very tender, gentle, poetic, and a dreamer. And this started, I think, from doppelganger. This thing came again and again in his composition, the existence of Floriston and Eusebius. Floriston and Eusebius were created from many other inspirations as well because he used to believe that Beethoven has got a magic wand and with that magic wand whatever he touches it becomes a masterpiece and Beethoven's one and only opera is Fidelio and Florestan is the unjustly imprisoned protagonist of Fidelio who said that in a chorus with other prisoners what a joy to breathe freedom the air of heaven so Floriston in, in Fidelio actually was crying for freedom and Schumann throughout his whole life cried for the freedom in art so might be his Floriston is actually taken from Beethoven's Fidelio's Floriston character. Coming to Eusebius, in one of the letters to Clara Schumann, rather Clara Wick, when he wrote the letter before his uh, marriage, he asked Clara to look at her own saint day in the diary and either side of it and he wrote that you can find saint eusebius there it might be has has it might have got some connection with his eusebius and he we know that he was he was very fond of two painters one is raphael the sculpturist and the painters of all time and another one is Michelangelo. In Raphael's painting we know Eusebius of Cremona is a very famous one. So his Eusebius might have got some connection with Raphael's painting as well. He not only created these two fictitious character, which we call his alter egos, he created a fictitious imaginary uh, society of artists as well, called David Bands, Band of David. And I was doing my research and I really felt that his David might have some connection to the great sculpture called the David of Michelangelo. Because the David of Michelangelo fought with the giant Goliath and he did not use any weapon or armor rather he used a stone 
and a sling and he used his brain, his intelligence. He was just a shepherd boy who was a musician as well. And with applying his intelligence, he actually killed Goliath. So Michelangelo's David was not completely perfect. There was some imperfection in the sculpture. And he deliberately did it in order to uh, convey the message that David actually portrayed or the representative of the normal human being. So he's the man of the people. And he followed, a, took a different path, not the stereotyped path of using physical strength and weapons in a, in a war. And that, if we look at the motto of the David Barnes or the Band of David, that society, in that society, the artist their fight was against the Philistines of art who were still using the outdated style. So he might have taken Michael Angelo's David as an inspiration in order to create his David. So that was kind of the journey of forming his own persona. If we talk about the world of music that time, it was a transition from harpsichord to piano. Piano, a huge sound, a, an instrument with huge sound potential. And then Beethoven already brought the romantic wave. Paganini joined it, but not everybody. Franz Schubert wanted preferred his classical style more. So he, he was truly a Renaissance man because when he came, it was a time of transition. It was a trying to revolt. And then talking about his bodily world, it was said that he had in the history we find that he had auditory hallucination he used to hear the word a constantly in his ear and he did write to uh, one of his friends uh, that he could uh, hear uh, actually uh, it's better to read it out from the letter uh, he said, the melancholy birds of night still flit round me from time to time, yet they can be driven off by music. So he was having quite a few symptoms and we know he had a tragic death in the asylum. Two years before that, he tried to throw himself uh, into the river Rhine tried to commit suicide. But in spite of all this mental illness, he kept on composing. He kept on giving us one, and one after another masterpieces. And one of his mental uh, illness was his obsession. For that, he destroyed his dream of becoming a virtuoso pianist because his fourth finger was quite weak and he uh, tried to do an exercise, but he did it, he overdid it, and he completely destroyed the power of his fourth finger. But what he did, he put all his uh, effort into writing being a critic, music critic, he has actually raised the standard of music uh, criticism at that time. It was not just a superficial flattery. He did it, he 
used his scholarly knowledge and he raised the bar. And another bit of his writing is writing compositions. So he put all his effort into writing. So with this three world, the world of music, the world of his persona, and the world of uh, his mental illness and other body, uh, 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 other other health issues. In spite of all this, he gave the world of music a, a big contribution, and he's uh, one of his composition called Carnival. In that, it is true that he did not compose in a, in a in an usual way, because in um, Carnival he used only four notes, and he composed twenty one pieces, and these four notes are from uh, the word called Ash. Ash is a name of a town where the, he, the, the lady called Ernestine, with whom he got engaged first time, she used to live. So no composer at that time would use four notes in order to create 21 pieces. We can call it his insanity, but Carnival is one of the most beautiful compositions in the world of Western classical music. So in my next episode, I am make part two of my um, next episode. I am going to talk about uh, his work in detail. And in this episode, how, how far the music is concerned, I'm going to play one of Chopin's words in A minor. But obviously I have borrowed the soul of the music, the true, the, 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 the core melody, and I have improvised it. Why I'm going to play Chopin's music? Yes, there comes the kindness and the big heart of Schumann's personality. As a music critic, he was always very keen to appreciate others' music. When Chopin was writing his early variations, he wrote in his journal, which he edited for 10 years, and he co-founded it with his father-in-law, Frederick Wick. He was one of the most famous piano teacher in Leipzig in Germany. And in that, he wrote about Chopin's com composition as hats off, gentleman. You are a genius. And then I'm going to read out another little letter, uh, which is uh, which he wrote in his journal in 1853, when he was not quite well, 23rd of October, after he made, made um, after he and his wife, they met Brahms for the first time. And he wrote in his uh, magazine, uh, which is new music, which is the new journal of music. I always thought, quote, that there would arise that one day there must suddenly arise a man who in an ideal form would incarnate the supreme expression of his epoch. Someone who would achieve mastery not by a progressive development but who would spring fully armed like Athena from the brain of Zeus. 
and he has come. He wrote that introducing Brahms music in the German world. So I have decided to play the work of the person whom he called genius because to me Schumann is a genius of all time. And how far I have learned, I have, I got exposed to his music and considering my pianistic limitation, I have composed a little piece for him. I wanted to dedicate it to him. I, I tried to bring few styles which he used to apply when he composed his music. But as I have said when I started this episode, Schumann is a very controversial character. Maybe the world of music have just started discovering him and giving him the true recognition. Maybe it's just the start now. So when I have decided to do an episode on him, I was quite quite scared, shaky. But the person who helped me, guided me, gave me the inspiration and advices how to go about it is my wonderful teacher, Mr. James Bellingham, as always. So I'll go ahead and play both the pieces for you all. Hope we will enjoy it together. And truly, from the part of my heart where I keep my most valuable emotions, I'm going to bring it out through my playing because I am giving tribute to someone who not only understood music in its true sense, who was misunderstood by many, for many years, by many people. So it's high time to actually appreciate and celebrate his music. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Let us enjoy the music together. I'll start with Chopper's words in A minor in an improvised version.
now I'll play the little composition I made for him.